One of the things I find fascinating in the Bible is that we can read stories in the book of Acts of how Peter suffered persecution, and then we can go and read Peter's own words that he writes to other Christians who are suffering persecution and see how what he encouraged them to do is what he himself did when he was enduring persecution. So, for example, in the book of Acts, we know Peter gets arrested, he gets imprisoned, he even gets beaten for his faith. And in uh, his letter that we call 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, he's writing to a group of Christians who are maybe not being thrown in jail at this point, but are certainly being um, spoken against and who are suffering trials. And this is what he says to them in 1 Peter 3. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in that name. Now, one of the things that stands out to me in Peter's words is, uh, as, as well as you know, what happens to him in the book of Acts, is this. All of the suffering and persecution that they experienced and that the people Peter was writing to experienced, it happens to them not because they're doing anything wrong. It's just because they are telling people about Jesus, and they are claiming to follow Jesus. There, there's no accusation of them doing anything evil or wicked. They're not being accused of murder or violence or theft. They're not trying to use force to get their way. They are simply seeking to tell people the truth about Jesus and to follow Jesus faithfully themselves. And for that, they end up you know, spoken evil of, right? People say terrible things about them. And sometimes they even end up in prison, beaten. Some later will end up giving their lives because they spoke about Jesus and followed Jesus. But we're going to see a little bit of that this morning in Acts chapter 5. We're going to focus on verses 17 to 32 of Acts chapter 5. This is part of sort of the uh, ongoing persecution that the apostles are experiencing. They've already been arrested once uh, in the book of Acts, even though we're not very far in. Here they are going to be arrested again, and we're going to see how they respond and how the way they respond uh, should encourage us and instruct us about how we should respond when others oppose us as well. So here's what Acts 5 says, beginning verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked, and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. 
Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, again, this is not the first time that Peter and the apostles have been arrested for preaching about Jesus. They uh, are arrested and they are imprisoned. And we are told that this happens because the high priest and those who are with them, the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy. Now, the word that Luke uses here to describe what they are feeling and what is motivating them could come could be translated as either zealous or jealous. Very similar words, right? Um, zeal is when you're really passionate and devoted to something. And, and Paul describes himself uh, before his conversion to Christ as a zealous Jew, right? For example, he says um, about himself in Philippians 3, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Right? I was so devoted to what I thought was right, I was throwing prison, uh, Christians in prison and, and persecuting the church. Uh, um, he says about the Jews, his own kinsmen, who have not come to faith in Christ in, in Romans chapter 10, he says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Because they don't know Christ. So in one sense, Luke could be telling us that they are they're zealous, they're passionate, they are so convinced that the apostles are wrong to be telling people that Jesus is the Messiah, that they will do whatever it takes to try to stop these men from preaching about Jesus. That's what Paul himself was doing. But it could simply mean that they are Jealous, And this word gets used uh, later in the book of Acts in ways that make it really clear jealousy is the meaning, right? Is, is the, uh, the way Paul, uh, excuse me, Luke intends us to understand this. For example, in, in Acts 13, uh, Paul is preaching, you know, one of his missionary journeys, he's preaching out there in one of the cities, and it says the next Sabbath, so he preaches in the synagogue one Sabbath, and then the next Sabbath it says almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling them. They were jealous of the attention that Paul was getting. They were jealous of the number of people who wanted to hear what Paul had to say. And we've already heard in the book of Acts how many thousands upon thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ. These men who were responsible for sending Jesus to his death, who thought by crucifying him they would be getting rid of him, are now finding that thousands upon thousands of people are following him. People are continuing to listen to the apostles and they are jealous and they are driven to try to stamp out this message about Jesus being the Messiah. And they will do whatever it takes to try to put a stop to this. Now, whether anyone is jealous of Christians today and, and, and the, the attention that Christianity and the church may get, you know, that, that may be up for debate. But certainly there are people who oppose Christians because they are zealous for a cause they think is right. They think religion and Christianity in particular is bad for the world. It's harmful to people. They are filled with zeal. And they want Christians to stop preaching, stop teaching, stop speaking, stop seeking to get others to follow Christ. Because they are, as Paul said, ignorant of the truth. They're without, they don't, they don't know Jesus. They're lost. They don't know any better. And just as Paul was uh, passionately praying for the conversion of the Jews who were zealous but without the knowledge of Christ, we too should not see those who oppose us as 
enemies that we should respond to in kind. Right? They hurl insults at us, we hurl insults at them. They oppose us, we oppose them. No, we, sh we should pray for them. We should have pity on them and mercy on them. We should seek to win them to Christ. We should want them to come to know Jesus, to come to know the truth. Not hate them, not revile them, but pity them and pray for them. And we should also be on our guard to make sure that we don't become like the Sadducees in this story. That we don't get caught up in a cause that we think is right and maybe even think pleases God and become devoted to that cause in such a way that we will do things that clearly displease God and justify them because we think God is on our side and we're trying to come to God's aid, as it were. That's not what the apostles were doing. That's not what Jesus called us to do. Jesus told Peter to put away his sword. And Peter listened. So much so that not only is he not carrying a sword around anymore, he's willingly going to prison and not complaining about it. Just because he's preaching about Jesus. Now, I love what happens next, and we have to go over this quickly, but they get, they get put in prison, and verse 19 says, During the night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So, they get thrown in jail, so they'll stop preaching. An angel of the Lord comes, opens the prison doors, and says, All right, get back to it. Keep preaching. Go tell them about Jesus. Go stand in the temple and tell them what's happening. And part of what I love about this is that these same people tried to keep Jesus in a tomb, and they couldn't do it. And now Jesus' followers, they think they can keep him in a prison, and that's going to that's gonna thwart God somehow. Right? It, it can't do it. God just sends an angel who's got a key, and open, you know, so to speak, and opens the doors, and out they go, preaching again. They, they, you, they cannot stop what God is doing. We've seen before in the book of Acts, no plan of God's can be thwarted. It's just not possible. And so what we see in this, in this story is that it, the, the religious leaders who are trying to put a stop to this, they can't get their minds around what's going on. Right? They, they can't figure out how they should respond to this. Later in, in uh, chapter 5, we're not going to get to this 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 morning, uh, a teacher named Gamaliel, he gets it, right? He actually gives them some good advice. But at this point, they, they've not yet figured out that they have set themselves against God and there is no winning when you do that. And so it's almost humorous, right, that when they, they, they convene the council the next morning and they're like, okay, go, go bring the guys we put in prison yesterday, go bring them, we're ready to, to talk to them. That... Uh, you know, the captain of the temple comes and says, well, um, there's no sign of a prison break. Like, everything was locked. Everything was in order. But those guys aren't there. I don't know what to tell you. They're not there. And it says in verse 24 that they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. I love that perplexity. They just, they just don't get it. They can't figure it out. They don't understand. And so they hear that they're preaching in the temple, the exact thing they were trying to keep them from doing. And so they, they send to, you know, almost re-arrest them, right, to bring them back to stand before the council. And uh, verse 26 says, Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Now, I want you to think about this. Who in this story is afraid and why? And who, do you, who would you normally expect to be afraid in this story? And why aren't they? See, oftentimes, um, fear is related to control. If you feel like you're in control, you're not scared. Right? If you feel like you're not in control, that's when fear starts to creep in. So, like, when you're driving, 
and you may be feeling kind of crazy. Like, you're like, it's fine, it's fine. But the person next to you who doesn't have their hands on the wheel or the gas or the brake, a little more fear, right? Because they're not in control. In this story, we would expect the apostles to be afraid. Because in one sense, they're not in control. They don't have the power. They're not on the council. They're getting thrown in prison. They're the ones being told by the authorities, here's what you can't do, here's what you can't say, here's what you have to stop doing. But they are not afraid. Why are they not afraid? Because they know that God is in control, and they're doing what God sent them to do, and that everything is going to be fine because God's in control. These men who are trying to tell them what to do, they're not in control. God is in control. And so Peter knows if they throw me in prison, God can open the prison door if he wants to. They tried to get rid of my Lord, my Savior, my God, Jesus himself. They put him to death. He just walked out of the tomb. So if he wants me out of the prison, he'll bring me out. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid because God is in control. But these men who are in charge of bringing the apostles before the council, they're afraid. Why are they afraid? They're afraid because they see these crowds of people that are gathering around the apostles, that are listening to the apostles, that are following the apostles, and they're afraid those crowds of people are going to turn against them because they're opposing the apostles. Now, the point of that is not to say that we should not be afraid when the crowds are with us. Right? Like, oh, well, the apostles weren't scared because they knew the people were on their side. No, that's not why they weren't afraid. Because later in the book of Acts, when Paul's in Ephesus, there's going to be a riot and the crowd is against Paul. And so his friends are telling him, do not go out there. You are going to get torn to shreds if you go out there. They're mad because they think Paul is, you know, maligning their goddess, Artemis of the Ephesians. So that they're there rioting in the mass. The, the point is not that we should not be afraid when the crowds are with us because sometimes they will be and sometimes they won't be. Right? The officers here who are arresting them, they fear for their safety because the people seem to be siding with the apostles. But Paul, again, his friends fear for his safety when the mob is against him. So it's not about the crowds. It's about fearing God. It's about knowing that God is on your side. Why was Paul so unafraid all the time? How many times did Paul get in prison? I don't even know if we know the number. How many times was he arrested? How many times was he beaten? He does give us a list of things he suffered in 2 Corinthians. How many times he was beaten? How many times he was shipwrecked? How many times he experienced this? How many times he experienced that? Why didn't that stop him? He tells us. We don't have to wonder. And I think the same thing motivated Peter and the other apostles. The same reason why they were not afraid. Here's what Paul says in Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you believe that, you can walk into prison unafraid, and you can walk out of prison and keep preaching unafraid. That's what Peter did. That's what Paul did. That's the example that they are setting for all of us who come after them. Now, when they finally come before the council, and uh, the council you know, sh shakes their finger at them again, there's two things that the council is mad at them about. The first one is... They told them once already not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they didn't listen. These are men who are used to people listening to them, coming when they call, doing what they say, and the apostles are not dancing to their tune, and they don't like it. Right? Verse 27 says, when they had brought them, 
they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And that's their first complaint. We told you to stop. You didn't stop. Why won't you stop? Why won't you stop preaching about Jesus? That's their first complaint. Their second complaint is, you're making us out to be the bad guys. He also says, so this is the last part of verse 28, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And why does he say that? He says that because every time Peter preaches the gospel in Jerusalem, he's got to talk about the death of Jesus. That's part of the gospel. Jesus died for our sin and then rose, and if we turn from our sin and trust in him, we receive forgiveness and salvation. Well, why did Jesus die? At whose hands did he die? He's got to talk about that too, right? The men right there in Jerusalem, they're the ones who did this. These religious leaders, they're the ones who handed Jesus over, who called for his death, who called for his crucifixion, and they don't like the fact that every time Peter opens his mouth, He's essentially pointing his finger at them and saying, these guys missed the Messiah so badly, they didn't just ignore him, they rejected him and sent him to his death. They don't like that. So how does Peter respond? He doesn't apologize. He's not done anything wrong. He's not saying anything that's not true. So here's what he does say, verse 29. Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Your first complaint is that we keep speaking about Jesus. Well, here's the problem. God told us to speak about Jesus. And if I have to choose between who I'm going to obey, God or you, it's not, I don't even have to pray about it. It's not a difficult question. It's obvious. It's clear. I must obey God rather than men. Now, that's not an excuse for us to do whatever we want. That's to say, if God says something in the Bible really clear, here's what you're supposed to do, and somebody else tells you not to do it, like Daniel is told, can't pray to anybody but the king. Daniel says, I don't pray to the king, I pray to God. There's one God, I pray to him. And no law is going to make me stop. Well, if you keep praying to your God, we're going to throw you in the lion's den. Well, then throw me in the lion's den. If God wants to shut the mouths of the lions, he can, and he will. But I I can't stop praying. I can't pray to you instead of God. uh, There's no choice. Peter and the apostles are in the same position. God said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. You've got to tell them about Jesus. Teach them to follow Jesus. That's what we're doing. You tell us to stop, we can't stop. We must obey God rather than men. What about their second complaint? Peter says, verse 30, The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. So you're trying to bring this man's blood upon us. Peter says, I'm just telling you what happened. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm I'm not trying to make you guilty of something you're not guilty. This is what you did just weeks ago, months ago. And I'm saying, here's what God did in response. Your verdict was, Jesus is guilty, put him to death. God's verdict was, he's innocent. God raised him from the dead and exalted him to his right hand. He's enthroned in heaven right now. A lot more power than you. A much higher position than you. He's the Lord. He's the leader, the ruler, the Savior. He's the one we are ultimately accountable to. He's the one we're preaching about. And he's the one you need to turn to. Peter goes on to say, God exalted him, exalted Jesus, at his right hand as leader and Savior. Why? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now, Peter could have launched into just like a word of judgment against them, right? You guys are under the wrath of God. You guys are going to be judged. You guys are going to suffer for rejecting Jesus. And that's true if they don't repent. And that's implied in Peter saying, but Israel needs to repent. You guys need to repent. You need forgiveness of sins. 
But what he highlights is that God exalted Jesus to this position, not primarily to judge those who rejected him, but primarily to save them, to give them something. Even though they sought to take his life, he's there to give repentance, to give forgiveness of sins. That is grace. That's what Jesus is offering. Even to turn to him, even to repent, is a gift from him. And that's what Peter's calling them to do. To repent, to believe, to trust Christ, so that they can receive forgiveness of sins. That is the message that the apostles and every faithful Christian and every faithful church ever since has been preaching and teaching and sharing and communicating. That's why we send out missionaries. That's why we do so many of the things we do. We want people to hear. Jesus grants repentance. Jesus grants forgiveness to all who bow their knee before him, who trust him, who ask him for mercy, who ask him for salvation. That's what Peter is speaking of. And there's something, though, that's unique about Peter, or unique about Peter and the apostles, that's not true of us, that was true of him. He's not saying these things just because he's heard them and found them persuasive. He's saying these things because he saw it. He witnessed it. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He saw him die. He saw the empty tomb. He saw Jesus raised from the dead. He could touch his body, know that he was really alive. And so he says in verse 32, we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit. We are telling you things that we saw, that we witnessed. We're not making it up. We're not telling you second or third hand. We're telling you what we know happened. And the Holy Spirit himself is bearing witness, just as Jesus promised in John 15, when he said, when the Helper comes, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness. So the Spirit is bearing witness, the apostles are bearing witness. And then he says something that if you're, if, you're, if you're not ready for it, it can kind of trip you up at the end of verse 32. He says, so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. You probably would have expected whom God has given to those who trust him. Right When he says God gives the Spirit to those who obey Him, that sounds kind of like, like a works salvation, which we know that's not what the Bible teaches. We know that's not what God does. God saves by grace, through faith, not by works. So why does he say God gives the Spirit to those who obey Him? Well, we have to remember that the Bible uh, makes very clear that trusting God and obeying God are not really things you can separate. Right? That's why we sing that hymn, trust and obey, right? because they go together. They're inseparable. But Jesus says, for example, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Keep it, well, I love Jesus, I don't obey him. That, that's not an option. You can't say, I trust God, I just don't obey him. James says, faith without works is dead. If you say you believe him, but you don't do what he says, that doesn't make any sense. So, it's not an either or, right? Either you get the Spirit because you trust God, or you get the Spirit because you obey God. If you trust him, you'll obey him. But understanding why Peter says this, and, and this, is, this helps for anything, anywhere in the Bible, it helps to think not only what are they saying, but why are they saying this? If I'm surprised by what he's saying, why is he saying something different than what I would expect? And here's the reason why I think Peter says this. He doesn't say God gives the Spirit to those who trust him, who believe in him, because the Sadducees claim to believe in God. They claim to trust God. And yet their works, right, their actions clearly indicate they don't really trust God. They don't really know God. Why? Because they're not obeying God. God sent Jesus, and everybody who recognizes Jesus as the Son of God believes Him and obeys Him. They're not obeying Him. That's why Peter says that. Now, if we are going to suffer, even just verbal opposition or, you know, pressure to conform or whatever. I'm not even necessarily talking about, like, what we think of as, like, 
serious persecution. Not, not talking about going to prison or anything like that, but just, just opposition. If we're going to suffer, let's make sure the reason we are suffering is because we are obeying God. And that's what Peter said in the passage I read at the beginning from 1 Peter 3. If you suffer as a Christian, great. Let's not suffer as a thief or a murderer or whatever, an like evildoer. Let's not put ourselves in a position where we are being opposed and suffering because we've legitimately done something wrong. That's no credit to us and certainly no credit to Jesus, whom we're claiming to follow. If we're going to be opposed, let's make sure it's because we insist on telling people about Jesus. If we're going to suffer, let's make sure it's because we are acting like Christ and not like his enemies. Even Peter learned to leave behind his sword. He didn't need it, because Jesus has the keys not only to any prison they could put him in, but Jesus has the keys to death and Hades. He's conquered the grave. Not even tombs will hold Jesus' followers in the end. If Christ who conquered death and hell is for us, what does it matter who may be against us? Let's pray.